Yesterday was painful. I mean, actually, through, through the call, I was all good. But I found in the aftermath on, on X, people were just brutal, brutal, brutal. I, I had my moment when I thought, to stop this. Good night's sleep. This morning, woke up and said, that's it. I have cash that I was waiting to invest. So I threw the first 30000 at it now. Uh, there's more to come. So I'm waiting for another... 30 and another 20 after that. So waiting for all that, but really comfortable with what I bought today. So let me resume what I got, got out of yesterday. There was lots of goods. The biggest good was actually how they were able to manage costs of goods sold. That for me is, is just astonishing. And people, some people read into it that, you know, that was the last cost of goods sold. Well, yes, for the current way of producing, but we're also going into a complete new manufacturing revolution that will have even further um, price cuts in, in cost of goods sold. So that, that was great. Auto gross margin stabilized is even slightly up. Operating margin stabilized slightly up. Free cash flow. I didn't expect that much of a free cash flow. We did more than 43% of the free cash flow just in Q4 of whole of 2023. So we're ending the year with close to 100 billion of sales, 96 billion, 4.4 billion of free cash flow, 29 billion of cash or, or equivalents on hand. Absolutely great. Still stable research and development, but what they did guide is that the CAPEX is going up now to 10 billion, which is much more than I had anticipated, which, and, and they said it will be 10 billion plus, mostly for AI and research and development. So Larry and I had this discussion before. I still hope they would do a capital raise. They're saying they have enough to all do that with their own financing. Well, be it. I, I just want them to throw as much in that field as possible but stay efficient, right? And we know how, how lean and mean they are. So all liked all that, liked the V12 rollout, um, liked what Elon said that now AI is for the first time, not only pathfinding and vehicle control, but actually object perception. So that's a major step and it's a major step for bots as well. Um, he reiterated a couple of times, Tesla is the most efficient company for IE inference. I mean, for the non-English speaker like me, it's important to understand what inference means. It's using observation and background to get to the logical conclusion. And that is just so rare. And there are not many players in that field. And certainly Tesla is one of the top uh, players. Then what else did I find good? Well, uh, everything talking about the new line, how they're improving manufacturing technology and how that is going to be the most important competitive uh, characteristic of Tesla. The next generation vehicle confirmed for second half of 2025. Now let's just hope that timing is that uh, with starting in Texas, waiting for the test Texas line to be laid out before finishing Mexico, which fair enough, I would have wished it would go a bit quicker, but they're prudent there. And then a third outside of North America plan doing it announced end of 2024. We know that both Berlin and Shanghai are waiting for those. So we'll see which one gets it. Uh, he also talked about bot deliveries to clients in 2025 like that. Um, he clarified why he need those 25%. I'm sure we're getting to that in a second because I want to talk about those proxy advisory firms and the bastards they are. Sorry about my English. Um, then uh, 4680 production line, Drew explained that they're actually for the first time ahead of the ramp with finished cell inventory um, now in cost reduction and production ramp phase. So we're, we've moved on. Uh, one is an assembly line, one is a production line, one is an assembly line, two test lines and four more added in Q3 of this year. They broke ground in Nevada. They confirmed 250,000 cyber trucks as delivery goals in North America. Now let's get to the not so good. I found Wave After Ninja, the CFO. Oh, I'm prepared. I worked on, on this whole thing all night because I wanted to co confirm to myself that I needed, I needed to invest this money and am I ready? And I am so ready. Um, so Wave After Ninja, sort of missed the goal with me. What he said when I see it in writing is good. I mean, on the advertising budget, I found him a bit flip floppy, uh, but he's not the best communicator. And I mean, I love Elon. I digest Elon stuff a couple of times before I'm really there. I just wish we would have a good CFO communicator. So I'm not sure whether he will step up or whether we need another person there. I'm a little bit uneasy there. Just want to say what I feel. Um, 
another thing I really feel a bit manipulative and, and I, that always gets my alert bells ringing is suddenly we're not talking about Tesla being bigger than Apple and uh, Aramco combined, but now we're at the most valuable company in the world. Now, I know where this is coming from. Elon and the board are obviously putting in place this comp plan and putting in milestones. I just felt that was a little bit what happened to that old goal of Apple and Aramco combined. And then him saying for the first time he sees that path to the most valuable company. Well, I can find you 10 quotes in past earning calls where he saw the path already. So this wasn't the first. I don't understand why this suddenly was sort of manipulated is the only word I've had. Um, with the, and I'm sure Larry can explain that better to us, with that recognition of that old tax write-up, whatever it was, the whole tax rates now go up. It is what it is. Um, the whole digital ad campaign investment in 2023, I found that was still a little bit weak. Weak is probably the best word I find. Um, I, I talked about the Mexico plan being slow. And now there are a couple of, so that was the not so good. And then a couple of bads. The bads were only four, but they are, they are what they are. The FSD take rate is obviously not improving. And I, I mean, obviously that is linked to V12 not being where it is yet. And I hope with the rollout in the next couple of weeks, we'll get there. But I think they have to seriously rethink pricing on, on FSD. We've had this discussion before. I really wish it comes down or at least a couple of months free for people to, to test it, whatever. Don't, didn't like it. Uh, a real hiccup for me was that there's no FSD licensing deal anymore on the horizon and that it only came out because one of the analysts really triggered the question until Elon had to say it. Remember two earning calls ago, uh, ago, it was like, oh, we're in early talks with an OEM. We got all excited. And if that question wasn't posed, we wouldn't even know that there's nothing on the horizon anymore. So I just didn't like that. Um, and then um, the guidance missing. I mean, again, it's not it's not a huge deal for me, but obviously for Wall Street it is. Gave me, gave me a good buying opportunity. And then the fourth last point in the bad colony is that they seemed like little boys surprised that competitors are stealing their information from Battery Day and AI Day. I mean, come on, get real. This is the most competitive industry we're in. And you're now just waking up seeing that competitors are stealing from your presentations. I mean, where are we? So that was it. I mean, the, the good by far outweighed the bad. And, and, you know, when I wrote it down this morning, I just said, stop worrying, stop being annoyed. Um, and, and all the points I brought up in the not so good and bad column are stuff that can be improved. Just have to be realistic about it. Thank you. For you want to announce the folks? Um, yeah. Do you want to announce the folks what you ended up doing with the stock this morning? Oh, I did. So I bought a thirty thousand dollars at one hundred and eighty-two or something. And like I said, I have a second tranche of thirty thousand waiting, and a third one of twenty thousand that's coming in a couple of weeks. So I'm you uh, timed it correctly today. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, it went a little bit lower, but I, I, I was good. I was. I'm not bad. I'm. I'm. I'm very happy about that purchase. It. You know, you know, once I'm through with thinking it through, I'm I'm a bit of, you know, I've tried to be not too spontaneous. And so once I was through, I was like, let's go for it. So, so I, I have it. to ask you, Alexandra, I mean, okay, so you, you did a fantastic job. I mean, I've never heard this uh, great summary of all the pros and cons. Mine was like a list of five and a list of four. Yours was like really complete. But everybody is saying, I mean, I, I just interviewed Pierre Fergu, he's the only person who actually believes that the stock is going to rise the second half of this year because, uh, Jeff, uh, I should, you got to watch his video that I just did with Pierre, I'll drop it on Saturday or Sunday. He talks about what you're talking about, cost of goods falling 3% each quarter, gross margins could actually improve, and as it improves every quarter, the street will see it. Now, but, but uh, Alexandra, I mean, you bought today. When everybody's saying that it's going to be flat for at least 2024, I just finished a show with Larry. Larry's saying 2024 flat could fall even further. Tell me why you thought today was good. Of course, you should buy when it's down, but exactly down I for mean, a whole I, year. I mean, down for a whole year. Yeah. Um, I mean, I bought over the last four years regularly. I had the biggest chunk in immediately when I went in in March 2020. That's still good. I'm still happy about that investment. But uh, but then I continued buying as I had money. So I never looked really at the stock price. I just, you know, I had this 
very long term view on it and just and just uh, uh, continued buying. And so I bought some over four hundred. Right, if you buy some after four hundred, you know the pi- the pain. And then. I didn't buy a lot at the second half of last year, just because a lot of expenses with my kids installing one at New York. I mean, there was so much to be paid. Don't make five kids, right? Should tell you all that, but that's another that's, story. That's your mistake, right there. That's exactly. your that's your decision. But but now, beginning of this year, I was ready again. I, ha- I had money, and I've been waiting. And you know, we've been talking in a DM chat for a while. It was a good moment to go in and whatever. And I just felt, you know, I, I was actually ready to buy a two sixty a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was ready to buy a 220. So when you then see 180, you feel comfortable doing that because you didn't go in at, at earlier levels in the in the recent week. So that gave me enough ground. Can it go down to 150? Of course it can. I mean, if I would be the one pushing the button and that would be the lowest point, people would know and I would be much richer than I am. But the but the I, I feel good purchasing this stock at 180 given my time horizon, which is still many, many years to go. I mean, I don't need this money, at least not in 2030 and probably not in 10 years. Okay, I want to bring Jeff up here because Jeff, you called it dead on. This, uh, I'm going to show this uh, chart here. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm, I'm jumping around here. But basically, your cost of good analysis was dead on. And you're one of the few voices that was actually I mean, uh, I got to give Larry also said something similar, but uh, separately, but you have been dead on here. So this is cost of goods shocked everybody. I think it was fell by $1,000. They did prove your number that there's going to be a $3,000, uh, a, a 3% reduction every quarter. So tell me what you're thinking yeah. about not only this, the, you know, what do, what do you expect for margins and cost of goods and so forth for the next year, but also the stock, if you don't mind, I know you don't, you know, you don't want to talk about the stock necessarily, but let me know what you're thinking. Yeah, I I kind of you invest in the business and you you trade the stock, um, but yeah, just going. I'll go. I'll start like closer to home with with, with Cogs. So the three and a half percent reduction quarter on quarter exceed actually exceeds like what most companies are actually able to do unless there's some special event. Uh, but if you look at it over four quarters, which is what you're really supposed to do over eight quarters, you know they have a pretty consistent track record of of driving eight. To, they have some eight to ten percent troughs that they've driven over an annualized time frame. And you look when there's interruptions, it's like, hey, we're bringing up Austin, hey, we're bringing up Berlin, which are huge net drags on Cogs. But if you look at like how they design product, how they manufacture uh, product. Um, th- th- uh, this is best in class performance. I just want to let people know, like this is 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 as good as it gets. I, I'm normally accustomed, like in the auto industry, something in the one and a you know one to two percent range. And you know they delivered three and a half this quarter. Um, they're all, you know they're they're organized differently than other companies. They kind of work as a unit on cost structure functionally, meaning you know they'll they'll get together all different functions and work on the drive unit, for example. And and really drive that to a target. They've got you know targets that come, and a culture that comes down from the CEO uh, on cost, and that it's it's hard to analyze that. If you're an analyst, it's hard to you know well what do you put on that in terms of a a, a multiple or what what does that mean? And uh, so anyway, getting back to the cog story, uh, the the prediction I had is that a they would surprise uh, and b uh, that they would start to exceed. Um, the pricing reductions, when you look at the pricing reductions in aggregates, so like the pricing reduction that just happened in January, everybody looks at the gross numbers and sees 6% in, in Europe. But when you divide that, you, when you realize that that's 10 or 11% of their shipping volume in the quarter, and you realize it's, okay, it's 0.66% of MSRP, and you just saw them print 3.5% on COG. So this is what I mean when I keep bringing up these examples. Uh, and now they've gotten through the factory shutdowns. They've gotten through a lot of the noise last year. And by the way, one of the things that actually helps them in this situation is that they move inventory through their system so quickly. So if Drew or Lars come up with an, an event driven idea to take cost out, it goes in and out through that system very rapidly. You're talking about the lead time of the component and you're talking about the, 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 some of the fastest process times to build a vehicle in the world. And then you've got you know, only 15 days of inventory in the chain. So basically they can, they can move. That's one of the reasons that they can drive cogs lower more rapidly is that 
Now, one of the big the questions I, I continue to get is like, well, you know, this gets increasingly more difficult. They're going to be able to do more. Yes, it gets more difficult. Yes, they're going to be able to do more. They are not at terminal cogs. You know, on a thirty six thousand three hundred, you know, kind of gross aggregate. You know, maybe there's certain trims where they're going to be more difficult than others, but there's still plenty of room for them to go uh, on cogs from here. And really, to me, all the way into the next generation, I think this is what's, what's important. There's not going to be some quarter where, like, unless there's some big issue with volumes or there's some big event, you know, they should be able to continue to drive cogs down pretty continuously until they get to the next generation vehicle. Again, it's going to get increasingly difficult. But I do believe they're going to do that. What I can't predict is what are they going to do on the pricing side is by, by the fact that they didn't guide on that call on either the volume vector or the gross margin vector. And it does that and, and the fact that they've reduced their price reduction campaign. This is what really irks me when analysts just say price cuts, price cuts, price cuts, actually do the analysis and understand like what is the gross impact on that in the quarter. Uh, and then and then and do the cogs next to it. Uh, it looks like they've really reduced the rate. Uh, they had price corrections in the first half of last year, and now we're just doing very very small changes. So the question is 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 that you know what they're going to continue to do? And 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 some of the verbiage I, I would have thought could have been appropriate on the call. Again, I'm not in Tesla management. I'm not saying I can do their job any better. But one of the comments, I mean, if it's true, you know, what is one of the comments like? Look. We're going to continue to drive pricing lower to get our product out to more people. However, we're going to do this in commensurate with our COGS reduction program. We're the best in the world at doing this, and, and, and we're going to continue driving that as a priority. I would have loved to hear them say that. Um, I loved An Alexander. That's just I, We can talk more about COGS in a minute, but it's going, to, it's going to continue going. It's not going to be at a perfect 3.5%. Don't graph 3.5% for the next you know seven quarters until they're building the 2020 that's not how it's going to work there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs the big the, there's really big opportunities with 4680 there's really big opportunities with underutilization uh in some of the gigafactories and there's huge huge opportunity in forward leveraging the new, the next programs and getting the getting the current suppliers to do a little bit of a stretch with them until they get to the next set of programs it's only next year 